All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Brown. I work at Single Store as a senior software engineer and am a co chair of the Bytecode Alliance's special interest group for guest language support. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about how we can get WASM components for every language. Now, there are two main points I want to make throughout this talk. The first is that we can make components for every language. That's a feasible, practical thing that we can do and are already have the tools to do. And second, that components that we make in different languages can work together, that we're able to have them compose and interoperate uh, trivially. And so the structure of the talk largely follows those two points. First, we're going to explain what components are and how they're structured and represented, what's actually in the guts of a component. Then we're talking about componentizing and walk through a few different approaches to making components, starting from the very bottom and doing it by hand, building up to some future possibilities. Then we're talking about composing, what composition is, how we compose components, and wrap up with a demo uh, where we stack a bunch of WASM components together. So components, uh, well, what are they? Components are, yeah, hopefully some of you saw Luke Wagner's great talk earlier, the component model is a proposal that's layered on top of core WebAssembly. And where core WebAssembly defines modules, the component model defines components. Modules are lower level. They speak in terms of numbers and linear memories, integers and floating point values. And components are higher level and are able to express more complicated semantics like records, lists, arrays, strings, resources, uh, and other facilities. And they're instrumental in expressing things as complicated as the WebAssembly system interface, WASI. Now, that layering idea that component model is layered on top of modules is also directly how it works. It's not just a metaphor. A component fundamentally contains a module if it's going to do any real computation. And your computation is still expressed in terms of normal instructions and things in a core module. What's different is that the component has its own level of import and export that are at that level of abstraction that we were just talking about with strings and records and such. And components contain the module, these imports and exports at its own level, and the lifting and lowering represented by those two arrows that adapt the semantics of the component model down to the lower level of the modules and give them a concrete interpretation. So if we want to look at the actual anatomy of a component, what's in the guts of it, we'll find that the sections of the component match that diagram I just showed you, that we have an import section of a function at the component level, C import here, then there's literally a section that describes the lowering behavior, how to take that imported function at the component model level and turn it into a core function. Uh, and those options in that sort of dot 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 ops section there are things like what memory is being used to put the data in, what encoding the string is in, how to allocate uh, data for lists and such. Um, and that tr helps us translate from the higher level to the lower level to give it a concrete interpretation. Then we have the actual module itself with your code in it. The full bytes of it are in your component. Components contain modules generally. And an instantiation of it, which looks a lot like sort of linking definition because fundamentally the component model is also a marriage of the uh, interface types in the module linking proposal. You know, it's sort of a discovery that really it's hard to treat those two problems separately and they're most usefully uh, handled by creating a new thing that wraps those two semantics together. And then we have a lift on the other side that takes that core function exported by the, uh, the module in the center and lifts it and gives it semantics, you know, and it, it tells the component model how to understand it. And this has all the same options as the lower did, as well as potentially a post return function that can be bound to one of those options. It tells you what to call to clean up things after you're done reading the values from an export. And finally, we export it at the component model level. We make it visible as the component model function as an external export of the component. Uh, and this is in the actual AST that you would see in the explainer specification for the component model. Uh, this is how components work inside. And I'll note that I only have one module in this sort of example component, but you can have as many modules as you want. We'll see examples later where there are more modules inside a component, and even components inside components. So componentizing, the act of making components, component as a verb, the most trivial version of doing this is by hand. We're going to write ourselves quickly a concrete component that does something somewhat interesting anyway. Uh, and that component is going to print uh, a hello message, hello from what, that we see uh, in memory here. And so what's inside this component for, to begin with is a module. And the module has memory, 8, which is the offset where the string begins in memory, 15, the length of the string, and then that string itself at offset 8. And a function that returns 0, because 0 is the offset in memory where that slice is described. Then we have a, the sort of core instance before. We tell it to instantiate that instance. Uh, and we alias its memory, which is just a sort of a thing we need to do so we can refer to it later in the, the lift. 
Then we have a section with a lift in it that says, hey, use the canonical ABI to lift this string. Use that memory that I just defined uh, and take this exported function called greet, use the string encoding UTF-8, and huzzah, we now have a function that returns a string. That's its result type. And we can then export this as part of an interface. And this right here you see on screen is actually a thing that you can pass into Wasm tools parse and get a real component binary out of that you can call using Wasm time and get a string out of. This actually works. So you're not really likely to do that by hand very often. I don't know how many of you have like solved a business problem by writing the business logic in assembly or WebAssembly directly. Uh, what you're likely to do, at least for languages that we can ahead of time compile to modules already, is use what we're calling kind of the wit bind gen method. And to explain the wit bind gen method, first let's talk a little bit about wit. It's this format. You all actually got like a flyer in your materials today with a wit guide, like, a little wit cheat sheet that explain the semantics of wit. This is what wit looks like. We're defining a little interface, you know, uncreatively named interface itself. Uh, in my little Wasm uh, Con 2023 greet package. And the interface just says export a greet function that, has a that you know, returns a string when you call it. And the component we just looked at before that exported just this greet function has this shape, this world, like Luke was talking about earlier, where it just exports this interface. That's all it does, it exports this interface. But we can also define other worlds like this proxy greeter world that say, hey, I'm gonna import a greet interface, and I'm gonna export it. This means that when we call this component's greet function, it can call this other greet function and compose them together. It can concatenate things onto it, for example. That's what we'll do in the example later. So the wit bind gen method, it takes the wit definition of your component, passes it into bindings generator to create source language bindings for your component. And maybe, you know, so every language is wit C or Rust, you'll get those sort of bindings, as well as embedding some information in there usually uh, with the information about the type of the component, because we'll need that later. Then when you combine that with your business logic, your code that the user wrote, uh, and you compile it through your compiler, you'll get a module at the other end that has a custom section with the type info. And this is really useful because we have this tool, Wasm Tools uh, Component New, that Luke also mentioned in the talk today, that can take a module with this custom section that defines its interface and turn that into a component. It'll generate the lifts and lowers it needs to adapt your module to becoming a component, and it will wrap it uh, in the requisite way. And so, Concretely, this is how you would do that for C. Whip Engine has a C export, and it is able to make uh, a header file and a source file uh, that are named sort of the name of your world, in this case, proxy greeter, and this object file that contains the type info we were talking about earlier that we need to smuggle into the system somehow. We're doing it through an object file that becomes a custom section that then gets interpreted uh, by the, uh, the component new tool. And then we're gonna combine that with this component.c file that has our actual logic for proxy greeter, uh, and we're gonna get this module we need. And from the module, once again, we run this component new tool, and it works just like before. And what's actually in component.c? Well, this is an implementation of component.c. Like, this is all the code you need to write to create a proxy greeter that appends and c to whatever the imported greet function did. So if your imported function would print the string, or create the string, hello from what, what we did before, and you compose that with this one, you get hello from what and c. And all we've done is really take this c and c suffix string uh, and allocate and concatenate that onto the uh, string that we got from our import. And this is also the same flow that happens for Rust, although albeit inside of Car Component, which is a tool that wraps this process so that you don't have to call these functions yourselves. You can just call Car Component uh, build and this will happen for you. But under the covers, it's also using wit bind gen. It's generating a module of code uh, that is inserted into your sources, that's combined with your uh, library code, and it's compiled with Rust-C to make a module with a custom section. And like before, a module in a custom section that has type info can be made into a component. And so we do so. Uh, and our source code to do that looks like this. And you'll notice the Rust code is a little easier to read than the C code. All we have to do is implement this trait guest for our component where we call the imported greet function and add and Rust to the end of it. And huzzah, we have a component that adapts an import to produce an export in Rust. Now, these approach I'm talking about, this bind gen approach works great if your compiler, if you already have a compiler that can take your source code and ahead of time compile it to a module. But what if your language is interpreted or, and has a runtime and garbage collection on these other facilities that aren't just the whole code AOT compiles to web, WebAssembly directly, if it's not quite so easy? Then we have another approach layered on top of this uh, that we're sort of, I'm sort of tentatively calling runtime wrapping in this case. 
Uh, and in this process, we're gonna do roughly the same thing. We'll still generally generate bindings in your language that adapt the types and create sort of the, the stubs of the functions that you need, and you'll combine your logic with it to make a code module. But that module might actually only have the binary data of your code. If it's like a bytecode, then JVM, you could, your, your module there could literally just be a data section that is the bytecode. And that's fine, or some of it might be ahead of time compiled to functions. But either way, what you're gonna end up doing is composing it with a pre-built runtime in a way that makes a new component that links the runtime into the sort of source code and compiled source code to make uh, this runnable component. And because these runtimes all tend to assume that you've access to the WASI CLI world, you tend to get a component that has this import of the WASI CLI uh, world stuff. But if we want to, we can use WASI vert to hide that import of the WASI CLI stuff. We can create a virtualization of the file system of the clock of random in a way that's sufficient to run these runtimes and create a component with no additional dependencies where we just have our import of greet and our export of greet. And we've hidden the fact that Python needed a clock somewhere. So there's two main tools that currently do this approach. One is Componentize JS, which if you're in this room, you're missing the talk on by Guy Bedford, unfortunately, due to timing. Uh, and this uses a pre-built SpiderMonkey runtime that has been designed to be instrumented uh, and have arbitrary bindings added to it. It has some cool features like the ability for users to configure the sort of JavaScript environment they work in, the globals and imports that are available in it, the flavor of JavaScript, and to add prelude scripts that initialize objects and sort of the environment for your code. It also uses snapshotting to improve startup speed. This means that since it's WebAssembly, it's able to run it uh, and pre-initialize it, snapshot the memory state, and then compose that into your result as well so that you start up with the engine already at the state where it's parsed your code. It doesn't have to wait for it to parse your code for no reason. Uh, and that execution is all completely sandboxed so that there's not any like, concern that you are non-deterministically pre-initializing it or the pre-initialization is going to damage something on your system. It's an isolated process. The code for this uh, is very simple, actually. The binding generation for JavaScript is quite nice in that you essentially literally get to import greet because our interface is that we import greet. Isn't that wonderful? And then we define this greet interface, which is our, the interface that we're implementing for the world with our greet function that does very trivially implement greet as calling the imported greet with and JavaScript at the end, and we export it. And what's cool is that this is actually also the shape of the component. Once again, it sort of goes back to that first slide where we had the five parts the, uh, of the component. The other tool that we have is Componentized Pi, uh, and this uses a pre-built C Python runtime. Uh, it has high-level bindings that are generated for Python, but the low-level lifting and lowering stuff and the real nitty-gritty bind gen is actually generated as a WASM module, which is a little different than it works for some of these other things. You don't generate like C code or something, you get actual WASM. Uh, and part of this is to work with some of these other cool things that, that uh, Compose Pi is doing, one of which is extension leaking. Because Python has so many different uh, popular libraries that use C extensions, uh, like NumPy, Panda, Scikit, et cetera, uh, a, a sort of dynamic linking approach was needed. And Compose Pi has this ability to link together dynamic libraries uh, as modules inside of your component and figure out how to, the symbols need to be defined and imported and link all that together. It's a remarkably clever thing uh, that you should go to Joel Dice's talk tomorrow to learn more about. Also, uh, it does the same sort of pre-initializing snapshotting that the JS does as well. And the code for that is also very simple. We import, uh, a, you know, a class that we need to implement, this abstract class interface off of exports, and we, implement, we import interface from our imports. And that means that we're able to call the greet function in our greet function. Once again, these are like very simple implementations because all of the hard work of making a component has been externalized to bindings generators and these componentizing tools. So fundamentally, these two approaches can take code that can be OT compiled to modules and code that can't be OT compiled to modules and make components out of them. So fundamentally, we should be able to componentize code from arbitrary languages. There shouldn't be a limit to what we can componentize. That said, in addition to these two approaches, there's also some future possibilities that go outside or beyond uh, what's currently been outlined in those, those two examples. Uh, for example, you could start to use the garbage collection proposal, WASM GC. Um, and one note that I want to start out with, though, is that you can already implement GC languages using linear memory. Uh, there's maybe advantages to using GC instead. If you are going to use GC, some notes uh, that are some challenges that currently exist is that WASM GC doesn't build in all language features, uh, features used by different languages, garbage collectors. So if you have some like interior pointers and things, you may have to uh, use a higher level abstraction that maps down to GC. There may be some effort there. Uh, your GC is often tightly coupled to your runtime. 
So there's some work would be needed to decouple it. While SMGC support is still a work in progress outside of browsers, unfortunately, like our previous speaker mentioned, uh, the work is still underway in WASM time. And additionally, the component model doesn't yet support WASMGC at the boundary. Uh, now, you can use GC internally. The component model won't have any opinions on what you do inside of your module. But if you want to pass something out to the other code, the lifting and lowering system that is in place that allows us to abstract, you know, and then unabstract data to move it through the system can't read directly from GC. So you'll have to make an intermediate copy in your linear memory that the canonical ABI will then read and write from, which is the current limitation that will, in the future, not happen. So, but in the future, as things go on, as these things become more mature and more developed, WASMGC can be really useful. Uh, especially if you're a new language that gets to start from the bottom and build Wasm GC as your GC, or you're a language that's small enough that you can decouple and rip the GC out of your system and substitute these GC instructions instead of having all the GC code that's already linked into your runtime. Which, conversely, if you're a really big, really old project, uh, I expect Python might have some challenges finding a way to rip GC out of their system and abstract it to using Wasm GC. But if you do that, uh, you know, that will require you to componentize differently. Uh, Right, the other thing that I want to see, uh, I think would be cool to see in the long run, is deeper toolchain integration, which is to say that compilers, instead of just generating bindings, could do, could interpret the wit and the components directly, could understand them, it could do the mapping of its type. So if you have a JavaScript string, well, or if you have a build tool for some language as its own string type, and it's going to have a function that export that returns a string, if it just knew how to generate the lifts and lowers required to do that on its own without needing bindings generation, then that could be really interesting. Um, and with that, one thing you could get out of that potentially is a better compiler user experience. If it can actually create errors that say, oh no, you exported a function that returned a string, but you needed a function that did this, that's different than maybe finding some uh, unclear error in your bindings generation that says, oh, the bindings type didn't match your type. Uh, if it can just say your component type and your source code types don't match, then that would be more uh, clear to users. Also, as async features are added, languages might want to be more aware of them. Uh, and the component model is going to have an evolving async support in the next year with uh, Preview 3 hopefully coming sometime in the next year or the year after that will be something that compilers might want to more deeply integrate. And the more that they understand the component model directly, the more is possible there. So it's food for thought, uh, GC and deeper toolchain integration. Uh, with that out of the way, let's talk briefly about co composing. I'll say frankly that I don't actually have a ton of slides on composing because it sort of just works, quotes. Uh, which is to say that it works a lot like uh, it would work for normal modules. If you have imports and exports whose types match, you can instantiate them together in such a way. Uh, and you don't have to match all of them, of course. You're not required to like produce a closure that fully wraps all the imports and exports. You can compose together components that, you know, as long as some of their exports and imports match, you're able to create a graph of these components. Uh, one thing that's cool with components is static composition. We're able to take two components and actually make a new component that, that expresses their composition. You don't have to necessarily use the, you know, the APIs in your linker or in the JavaScript API for WebAssembly to instantiate one and then instantiate the other. You can create this compound expression of the two components that is then itself a component, which is a powerful tool that we don't have uh, currently without it. Now, the one challenge that uh, you know, composition has that you know, for components, that is not a thing modules have to think about because they only have one type system, which is this like low level integers and memories, is how to actually lift and lower across two components. So strings, as, as an example of a type that have different concrete representations, strings are encoded differently. String just means a sequence of Unicode scalar values, but that's not a bit pattern. Like strings fundamentally, like a Unicode string does not have a bit pattern. UTF-8 has a bit pattern, UTF-16 is a bit pattern, but strings do not. So if we want to pass a string from one place to another, it's important to know what the underlying representation of those strings is. For example, if in one side it's UTF-8 bytes that are lifted to being a string, and the string on the other side is being lowered to be UTF-16, needs to be brought down and represented in its memory that way, then uh, the operation we do fundamentally is whatever's minimal. In this case, it's a transcode. So if we lift on one side and lower on another side, uh, we can create sort of the minimal conversion adapter between the two concrete representations. But there's never, a string is never constructed. There's not a process whereby we say, this is the format that all strings have, the singular ABI of all strings, we're gonna make that string and then pass it across the boundary. Uh, strings an abstract type, and depending on what concrete types are on either side, we do the minimum conversion possible. That means, for example, that if the two things on either side were both UTF-8, we would get to just have a fused copy and validate operation that just says, is this value UTF-8? I don't want to give somebody else garbage and, and potentially uh, propagate sort of uh, issues between systems. And they are disjoint linear memory, so we need to copy them. But that's all you have to do. There's no transcode. We're not transcoding to UTF-16 and back. And this is true for any pair. UTF-16 to UTF-16 would do the same thing. It would just do a copy validate. 
we don't like force arbitrary round trips through concrete types. And that's pretty cool, and that's fundamentally what composition looks like. And the types might be more complex. It might be records and such on both sides, but the philosophy is the same. There's a lift on one side, a lower on the other side. You link them together and make the adapter. And that's what your uh, component tooling is doing for you. Now, we're going to go to a demo uh, I'm calling Tower of Wasm. And first, what I want to do is just show uh, the code for each of those examples uh, in sort of this uh, VS Code project that I have. Uh, and so all those examples we saw before are the actual code I'm going to run during the demo. That's sort of the point I want to impress on here. Uh, and they've been built to components in a way that um, using tools that exist in the open source today. And these components down here are the five components I showed during the talk today. And to boot, we can use this cool tool called Wasm Builder that lets us drag and drop components together to chain an arbitrary sequence of components, linking their imports to the other exports, to their imports to their exports. And so what we can do, for example, is take this component, download it as, uh, we'll just call it component one, and then if I go uh, to my shell, Let's actually go to the other shell. We can use this runner that I've created using WebAssembly, uh, using Rust that embeds Wasm time uh, to execute uh, this component. And the cool thing here is that that component we saw before, if we want to read through this, this says hello from Watt and C and Rust and Python and Rust and JavaScript and C and Python. If we go back to the example we had in the browser there, we'll see that it's C and Rust and Python and Rust and JavaScript and C and Python, uh, which hopefully uh, is this exactly the same. What's interesting is that we just executed a composite component there that has Python on the top and then C and then JavaScript and then Rust and Python and Rust and C and Watt, and we executed a call all the way down that import graph and all the way back up again building this string, and it works. The different encodings between the different languages, the bindings requirements, the composition, the lifting and lowering, all happens. And this is a component that includes JavaScript and Python, which are actually embedding uh, WASI virtualization in them in order to virtualize their file systems. And all of this is something that is present and working today. And the cool thing that I want to invite uh, the audience to do, assuming we have time, uh, is we're going to build our own uh, as an audience here today. So the one requirement is that what has to be on the bottom, because as I showed earlier, it only has an export. But I want to ask the room to just shout out a language, and we'll pick what goes uh, next on the end of this chain. So can I have a language? Rust. Rust. We'll do Rust next. And another? And another? Well, let's go out of order a little bit, guys. Uh, something else? Python? <laughs> We're very, feeling very creative today. Uh, oh, I'll start just grabbing some random ones then. Uh, but I'll grab Rust and... Uh, and we'll go back to JavaScript again for kicks. And then pick me something else. JavaScript, JavaScript again, why not? Uh, and finally, we'll do one more. I heard C. All right, and now I'm gonna need a second to link all these together uh, with my little trackpad. But all I'm doing here is I'm drawing an edge between these imports to say, yeah, I want to take this export of this one component and make it the import of another. And you guys probably can't even see the lines. Uh, uh, when we click the, ex the download button at the end, it will generate a composed component. Uh, and I believe and during that process, it will validate that these imports and exports. Uh, can... Oh, it's checking all as we go. Well, then we're already getting validation as we go. And the last thing I'll do is I'm going to check this box on C that says that we're going to export the exports of this as part of the overall component we build. We're going to download this as component two. Uh, and then, oh, I think I clicked outside the box there. Component two. Uh, yes, for, for JavaScript and Python, it does. And so what we're going to do here, uh, whoops. Before we run it, let's verify what we expect it to say. We expect it to say, hello from Watt and Rust and C and JavaScript and Python and Rust and, and JavaScript uh, and JavaScript and C. And let's see if that's what we see. Right. 
So we have hello from Watt and Rust and C and JavaScript and Python and Rust and JavaScript and JavaScript and C. And would you look at that? That is the exact order of composition that we just did. And what's cool is that we can do this in any order we want. The reason that I would like want to do an audience interaction thing here is to show that this isn't something that works under specific combinations or a specific order. There is generally the ability to compose languages, compile the components in arbitrary ways that are legal with the wit type system. Uh, and that's mostly the talk. Um, so. All right, I want to do some acknowledgments really quickly. Uh, single store, my employer, for helping uh, me work on uh, at the, with the bike code alliance and these projects, as well as lots of people who gave input on these slides or helped uh, make the tools and the demos work. Um, and with that, uh, that's what I've got. <laughs> right, so we have some time for questions, actually. Do people, I'm happy to revisit slides and answer any questions people have. So what's lifting and lowering was the question. And let's go back to a previous slide uh, as a tool here. Lifting and lowering is conceptually, I want to think about it in terms of abstraction, like, like low level, like a concrete thing, like UTF-8 bytes that represent a string. And a high level thing, the component model string type. And lifting is, when, is the operation that tells you how to go from, uh, like if I return a string, I return some bytes, right? Then my function returns a string. So I need a way of getting those bytes to somebody else. And in order to go through the component model, uh, there's this like V pattern you go through. You lift up to the right, and then you lower down to the that, and because you, you're going up through the component model. Um, and that's sort of a way to visualize it, uh, is that it's a way of converting concrete types to these abstract wit types and back again. Uh, and so we lift exports and we lower imports. Uh, and then we lift and lower arguments and returns uh, based on which thing. So an export that returns something, we have to lift the return of an export. We actually have to lower the argument of an export, because if you pass a string into something, uh, that thing is going to have to tell it how to turn that abstract string into a concrete you know, string in memory that it can process. And lifting and lowering is just the name we give to this process of mapping values from uh, the, the core WebAssembly to the component model. But JavaScript string is a concrete choice of what a string looks like. So we're lifting that concrete choice of what a string looks like to this abstract concept of a string by saying, by telling it what encoding to interpret it as, you know, to interpret it as a sequence of Unicode scalar values, because JavaScript doesn't have, a, you know, has concrete bytes. Right. Right, yeah, then it would be on the right-hand side of this example. It would be like the, the UTF-16 bytes on the right. Actually, UTF-16 even, so it you know, works there. Uh, so then, yeah, if you're passing a value into JavaScript, like you're, the JavaScript is calling an export of something else that it imports that returns a string, then it would need to lower it into its internal JavaScript. And I think we have a couple other questions. Yeah, there, uh, so with the exception of resources, which are handles that act as a sort of referential passing mechanism, strings and records and all these things are value types that are structurally passed. We have a queue of three questions, so I'm trying to get them in order. Uh, you, so a couple of related questions. Firstly, if you just pass through strings, do you, do you have to lower grades? Or like, uh, even what do you mean by pass through strings? Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. There's not really a way to get like an opaque handle to a string passed into you that you can pass to the next person without ever seeing it. Yeah, fundamentally, uh, there's not sort of that ability to take in something from an, an export, an import, and pass it straight to an export without ever seeing it yourself. It has to get lowered into you, and then you would lift it for the other person. Uh, there's maybe an optimization that would be possible that would be interesting if we could have some way of doing that. I don't think that's fundamentally impossible, but it's not something that's a use case. Yeah, that's true. For strings and value types, you cannot do this. For resources, if somebody passes you a resource, it's a handle. You get an integer. You pass. You were to pass this handle to somebody else. You pass them an integer. So, so There's no. That sort of represents an alias to that string. Maybe it has a get method that returns a string, and you just choose not to call that method because you don't care. And then you call that. Right. So, for example, the HTTP request and response headers are going to be resources that you can get the string from. But if all you're doing is proxying it and maybe modifying a couple things, you don't need to see every byte that makes up that request. You're just passing it the handles through. And we have another question here. You said that in practice, like the strings don't get raised into some canonical representation. Is 
Right. There is a pool of... Right, so uh, we currently have what's called the canonical ABI, which is a single parameterized ABI. It's parameterized in terms of encoding, for example, for which memory you're using for your reallocation function. Uh, but it's a single parameterized ABI that's currently possible. And that does have a finite number of parameter values of finite encodings. And so in the moment, yeah, passing strings between is just a question of having an answer to how to map between the finite parameters that are possible for lifting and lowering a function import and export. In the future, the interface adapters as uh, uh, given by the interface types proposal will eventually, someday, many <laughs> far into the future, be a thing that the component model uh, will attempt to pursue. So for example, we'll likely have functions at the component level that are adapter functions that, give you, that let you give you full control over the ABI that your data is being passed in. Uh, in fact, uh, that's one of the ways we could eventually support GC really well, is by letting you customize the adapter by which we lift and lower your, your data. So if you ran into another language right now, it would be a totally different coding for strings. Then what it would need to do is it would have to marshal to a valid source of the canonical ABI and then do that. Uh, and so, for example, if your language internally uses GC today, then you're going to copy it into linear memory in one of the supported encodings and shapes uh, to do this. And we had a, another question here. Wonderful. Uh, a question back. Potentially, because the canonical ABI is only so parametric, is only so flexible, if your language was really far from the canonical ABI, then that could involve some cost between two. But as much as possible, and specifically in this example for strings, we're able to do the minimal amount of work. And as we eventually get adapter functions in the distant future, they will really be the full realization of like reducing the work between two things to as close to zero as possible. But what we have right now is a distinct amount of work that you have to do because of current limitations. Another question. Yeah, since they're passed by value here, if you modify a value you've received, that doesn't do anything to the person who gave it to you. So in particular, you could imagine that like, they named multiple different representations of the string instead of like, having like, fields of representation and then like, generating a new one. So then like, these two pass it through, you don't have to do a double recount. There's some interesting things that are possible here. Um, in sort of this question of like passing data through components without requiring multiple conversions of like, there's interesting things that I would be curious to see about, you know, if I call an export and it gives me a value and I pass that value back in through an, into a, the argument of another export, wouldn't it be cool if I reduced the data movement that's there? Yeah, you really don't want to do a double You ideally don't want to do a double uh, re-encode. At the moment, you would because of current limitations to the canonical ABI. But you can imagine just generating like all right. right, there there are possible ways of caching and, and preserving multiple versions of these values, um, but that's not a thing that's currently possible. We only have a couple minutes, so I'll take one more question, then we'll wrap. In the back there, we have one last. When you start getting into sort of composition in multiple different programming languages, like what does debugging start to mean? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, I, there is work on debugging and improving, like, adding debug symbols to WebAssembly modules and components. There's a, a special interest group of the Bytecode Alliance focused on debugging. Currently, I think if we wanted to debug what we just ran, I imagine it would be quite a pain, uh, to be fully blunt. Is but, there like a, like a for a debug proposal? Uh, so there is a representation of debugging symbols information as custom sections in WebAssembly. The challenge here is that since there's so many of those, I don't know that the current tools are, can, uh, Peter, I don't know if you have a thoughts on that. Okay, you look like you maybe had something to say. Well, then I'll revise my answer to I haven't tested it, so I can't promise. Uh, and with that, I think we'll wrap. Thanks, everybody.